Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Tara Wick, and I'm a community partner with the Colorado Trust, and I would like to welcome you to the webinar, A Case for Co-working with Brian Watson from Proximity Space. Um, this webinar is the third in a six-part rural development learning series, which is taking place between now and January 18th. The series is sponsored by the resident teams in the communities of Antonito, Avondale, Dove Creek, Olathe, San Luis, and Sawatch, in partnership with the Colorado Nonprofit Development Center and the Colorado Trust. Each of these communities has an organized team of residents who have committed thousands of volunteer hours over the last two years to identifying and analyzing their community's most pressing issues and are developing community health equity plans to address these issues at the roots. Each resident team has identified depressed economic conditions in their rural communities as a root cause issue, one that especially affects children and non-college bound young people. Communities have recognized that depressed economic conditions are intrinsically bound with social disconnection and systems of discrimination that often play out along race and class lines. Residents know that building their power, especially the power of those most affected by the issues to advocate for themselves and their community's future will be an important part of any solution. These webinars were designed to connect resident teams to statewide experts working on solutions to Colorado's rural economic development challenges and to inspire thinking and conversation at a local and regional level. Recordings of these webinars will be made available on the Colorado Trust website for later viewing. A number of resident teams plan to invite community residents, local elected officials, and other partners to view and discuss these webinars together. The webinars will be interpreted and the material will be translated into Spanish in the coming weeks. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Brian Watson. Brian Watson is the owner of three co-working spaces on the Western Slope and a partner of Proximity Space in Montrose. In addition to running companies, Brian is passionate about economic development and understanding the key factors for growing communities. So Brian, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me, Tara. I'm really excited to have this conversation with everyone today. Um, as you mentioned, I'm um, an entrepreneur. I've grown up on the Western Slope, so I was born in Denver, um, but my family moved us over here to Grand Junction. Um, when I was in first grade, I was raised here, and today we're going to be talking um, really about our kind of the history of how we started and got involved in co-working. Um, and what all that, that looked like. Um, we were working on building kind of our community for several years before we had a co-working space. So I wanna dive into that and then um, just really dive into a lot of the things that we've learned along the way. Um, it's been uh, a very interesting learning experience. And so I'm gonna hopefully take us through that. If anyone has any questions or anything, um, or you want me to stop and dive into something deeper uh, please don't hesitate to um, just yell at me or send a text message or anything um, and we can continue. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and here we go and I'll get started. So let me share this real quick. I think we should all be able to see it right now. So um, again, my name is Brian Watson. Uh, we are, we have, I'm a partial owner in three different co-working spaces here on the Western Slope. So uh, we have a co-working space in Grand Junction called Factory Co-working. Um, and then we have uh, two, one in Montrose uh, under the name Proximity Space. And then we recently opened a, a co-working space in Ridgeway, Colorado as well. Um, what's cool, and we'll dive into this a little bit more, but all three of them uh, run off of entirely different business models. I think what's really exciting is that um, co-working is a trend that's taking place all over the nation and it's continuing to like exponentially grow as an industry. Um, and so uh, a lot of co-working spaces in big cities are making more money and are maybe more lucrative, but uh, we're seeing them pop up in small and rural communities as well. And um, they are huge economic drivers uh, for small towns and um, are prov providing a lot of resources to the community that I don't necessarily think people um, have thought of before. And so we're gonna dive into that. Um, and so 
uh, I guess let's get started. Um, again, our, our company is Proximity Space, and uh, today what I want to start off by talking about is just um, living in rural towns. Uh, this is, I love this picture because I think this paints like the perfect picture of what people think about when living in small and rural communities. Um, my parents moved uh, me and the rest of our family over to Grand Junction when I was in first grade. Um, and they chose to move back to Grand Junction for a lot of the same reasons that other people are choosing to live in small towns, which is um, it's a place where you can have impact on your community. It's the place where quality of life is really high. Um, living in a small town is really nice and um, is a great place to raise your family. And so there's all of these big benefits of living in a small town, right? Um, and it's like the American dream. And um, the problem is a lot of our small towns um, are starting to look more like this, right? Um, we have vacancies on Main Street. Um, a lot of our small communities are really uh, based off of legacy industries that are changing or going away. And so the question really becomes, what do we do about this? And that's really where we started. Um, I had uh, grown up in Grand Junction, but then helped a buddy of mine um, who started uh, retail stores. Um, I moved out of town to help him grow his company. Um, I lived in New Mexico for about a year and a half. And then after living in New Mexico for a year and a half, I was really excited to move back to Colorado. Um, and I came back um, at the same time, many of my friends uh, were moving back into town and all of us were entrepreneurs. And we were talking a lot about what it would take to change our community. Um, we moved back and were able to see a lot of things that we loved about Grand Junction, but at the same time, there were many things that we were missing and many of the features that larger um, metropolitan areas had, we just didn't have here in town. So we started to talk a lot about what would that look like if we had X, Y, Z? What would it look like if we had a more vibrant startup ecosystem? How would we go about attracting entrepreneurs? Um, and so we were having a lot of those conversations. Um, here's an interesting graph here, and it shows that in 2012, rural communities across America actually hit an all-time low and had a negative growth rate. And I think this is, this is the big conversation. Um, what we learned in a lot of the questions that we were trying to answer for ourselves, uh, we have realized we're not unique to us. It's really rural populations on a whole um, and as you can see to 20, 2015, it's starting to trend back upwards, which is great. Um, and we want to continue to provide uh, resources in small towns and help small communities diversify their economy. And um, there are great ways to do that. I think co-working um, is doing that, but um, I wanna go more through like, like what we've learned uh, to continue this conversation, because this is really um, I think where my heart is and the heart of our business is trying to figure out, okay, for small communities to really throw, thrive and continue growing, uh, we need to be able to rally entrepreneurs and we need entrepreneurs who are dedicated to their community to make an impact on their community, continue to grow their community. And so how do we harness them um, and how do we identify who they are? And so that's really the conversation um, and that's really the question that I think about a lot as an entrepreneur um, that's running co-working spaces. And so um, that's, again, I want to dive a little into the history of how we started uh, our co-working spaces and then move more into the um, case for co-working in small communities. So um, our next slide is um, when I moved back from Albuquerque, uh, back to Grand Junction, um, I've was finishing up school at uh, Colorado Mason University. And um, I picked up this book and this book has had a huge impact on me. So if you, um, which all of you are um, working in economic development, um, this book is written by Brad Feld and speaks a lot about what they have done in Boulder for the last 20 to 30 years to really harness um, entrepreneurs. So Boulder is, kind of a, a tech and startup hub of not only the state, but also one of the hubs of um, our nation for tech and startups. 
um, but they haven't always been like that. And so this book really dives in and creates a blueprint of what they have been doing for the last uh, 20 to 30 years to create um, that diverse um, entrepreneurial ecosystem. And it's really good because it talks about all the different parties involved. It talks about universities and economic developers and entrepreneurs and where all of those um, entities, what roles they play within the um, startup ecosystem. And so this book was really, uh, had a huge impact on me and really uh, spoke to me on everything that I was thinking about when I was moving back to Grand Junction of, you know, what are we gonna do? How do we go about doing this? So if you haven't read Startup Communities, I would strongly recommend um, picking up this book and reading through it. I probably read through this book two or three times a year. So um, I think it's that important. Um, anyway, so I had moved back. I was getting ready to graduate uh, from Mesa. And um, my plan was actually to move to Boulder after I graduated. So um, I had an opportunity to do an internship at Techstars, which is a, a company that Brad Feld, who wrote this book, uh, runs. And it's a business accelerator. And so for me, I've always been um, really excited about entrepreneurship and startups and so that was like kind of a dream job for me and that was my plan um, until all of my friends moved back and we started talking about well what if we committed to Grand Junction our community what if we um, decided to grow roots in our community and try to have an impact and so um, during that time I picked up a new mantra and um, it continues to really be my mantra uh, which is our community our responsibility and um, again, I think that this is so important. And what we need to be able to do is, as economic developers, is find um, not only ourselves, but other entrepreneurs and people in our community. Um, it's people who realize the change that we want to see is our responsibility. And we're not going to complain about it. We're just going to roll up our sleeves and, and get to work and make sure that we can do what we want to uh, see accomplished. And so, um, again, this really kind of became uh, the mantra. And so we started an organization, my buddy Josh Hudnall and I um, <clears throat> started an organization called Launch Wesco. Um, Josh had moved oh, back to Grand Junction at the same time that I moved back to Grand Junction and he was an app developer. And so he's a programmer. He's an incredibly talented guy. He's built um, apps for Oprah Winfrey and Oracle and um, found himself living in Grand Junction and thought that he was like the only programmer or the only person doing tech in all of Western Colorado felt totally isolated um, and so uh, like I said I was getting I was thinking about moving to Boulder we were both really interested in startups and uh, tech and so we said well what do we do to kind of figure out if there is any community. And so we started hosting events all the time. Um, we would host startup weekends. We hosted an event called Go Code Colorado. Um, and we really wanted to seek out and find um, if there were indeed any other people in our community uh, who was working on things like this. So we'd host um, three events every month for two and a half years is how we started. And this was before we had a co-working space. We would literally call up, you know, this is a, a, a programming event that we would host once a month called Coffee and Code. We'd jump on to the, the meetup or show up and it allowed us to really work on the internet. So we would host meetups um, for all sorts of entrepreneurs. So we did three meetups a month. We did one called Beer and Business, which was just a regular networking event for people who were interested in tech or startups. Um, we did one called Coffee and Code, which was specifically geared towards programmers. So a lot of people who are working remotely or at their house or in their basement uh, that are working on programming stuff are trying to solve really big problems. And so not having a group of people that they can talk to becomes really challenging and they spend all day, um, you know, looking, reading through tutorials, trying to figure out how to solve problems. And so having a strong community that they can reach out to or speak with um, is really beneficial for them. Uh, we also started another group called the Western Colorado Creative Professionals, and this was really focused on 
anyone um, in the creative industry. So videographers, photographers, graphic designers, um, and everywhere in between. And so what we found was when we started, we didn't know if there was anyone else focusing on startups or entrepreneurship or this type of thing um, when we started. And over the course of three years, we grew that from just Josh and I to over 800 members that we found locally. And so this was a really big deal. And we learned a lot about our community and just the assets that we had. Um, we No one was aware that they were here because everyone was working from home. And so um, by doing those meetups, that is really what allowed us to build a network and a community um, and kind of gain critical mass in the area. Um, so we did, like I said, tons of meetups. Um, and these are, you know, just people coming together and, um, and, and building relationships. And we had lots of fun. We did, um, this is from GoCode. And so really just the power and impact of people coming together was what allowed us to kind of grow our community. And then after doing that for about two years, um, we were finally able to open up our co-working space in Grand Junction. Um, so we have turned the old city planning building into what is now uh, 750 Main Street and that's factory co-working that we have there. Um, the whole building has been, we're at 100% capacity, we're looking to expand upon that. And so again, I think I wanted to tell that story just because I don't think um, we ever knew that this was possible when we started. We really just started to see if there was other people that were interested in this sort of thing. And then after doing it for two and a half years, we realized that there was a lot of people that were really looking for a community to plug into. Um, and we've seen a lot of benefits. So that just kind of gives you a quick background. And now I want to move into um, the next section, uh, which is really a case for co-working. So um, as we've built our co-working space, we've learned that not only has it been really beneficial for us, um, but there's huge benefits of opening co-working spaces, especially in small and rural communities. And so I want to dive into that a little bit more. So um, first, um, I think one of the things that is uh, changing a lot is really what business looks like today and is going to continue looking like in the future is different from what it's looked like in the past. So as economic developers, we are, um, ooh, sorry, I'm, I'm skipping forward. So um, one of the things that we learned is that you need six things to really build a startup ecosystem. So the first thing you need is ideas. Um, the second thing you need is entrepreneurs to take those ideas and turn them into businesses. Um, then you need a large network of mentors that you can connect to entrepreneurs as they're starting their businesses because starting businesses is hard. And so being able to connect mentors with entrepreneurs to help them overcome the obstacles. Um, some of the obstacles that they don't even see is really important. Um, next, you need a strong um, strong access to capital and not just traditional capital like banks, but diverse capital. So um, a lot of startups would never qualify for traditional lending. So being able to get them connected to SBDC programs or venture capitalists or angel investors um, or state and federal grants for their business is really important. And so having strong ties to those different types of um, avenues for capital are really important. Um, and, and next you need workforce. So as these businesses are growing, um, the economy is doing pretty good right now, which is great. But one of the big challenges a lot of our companies are dealing with, even in our co-working space right now, is finding um, ready and able talent who can just move into the job and start um, moving the dial for the business. So having workforce is really important. And then last is density. So, okay, it looks like you're moving to where you have a better connection, huh? Okay, thanks for hanging in there, everybody. Um, hey, Brian, as, as you're kind of reorienting yourself and resituating yourself, I just want to make sure and, um, and say that some of us won't ha have never been inside a co-working space and don't know. So I'm guessing you're going to get to that, but just mm -hmm. wanting to make sure that um, because you're so steeped in it, you don't forget to lay out the very, very basics of what co-working yeah. is for us at some point. Totally. Um, Great. Uh, coming up 
shortly. So, uh, so these are really the, the, the six things that are needed to build your startup ecosystem. And uh, next, we're really going to dive into why co-working is such a huge asset. Um, and it comes back to uh, changes in, uh, in the industry. So um, economic development for a long time has been about trying to recruit big companies to your city. And um, so when we think about recruitment and we think about businesses that we want to recruit to our city, um, a lot of times we're thinking about places like this. You know, oh, we need this company with a bunch of people um, to move to our city. But more and more um, entrepreneurs and business looks like this, right? A, a single entrepreneur who is making a big impact um, and building a big company um, out of their living room. And so um, what we really found when we were doing our meetups were, again, we didn't know if there were any, like, any companies in town doing this type of work. And what we found was there was tons. We went from zero to 800 in a couple years. And we found out about new companies every single week that we never knew existed in our community. And so what we need to do is um, to move the dial for our community is literally um, inventory every single person that lives in our town and figure out who they are, what they do, what their skill set is, what are the biggest challenges that they're facing and how can you connect them to the resources um, that they need in order to grow their business. And so um, having a co-working space is a great solution um, for that. So if none of you have ever been to a co-working space or are familiar with a co-working space, um, this is inside of one of the co-working spaces that we have on the Proximity Network. And um, again, the, the benefit of co-working is it's a beautiful centralized location um, where people can access, they can run their business out of there. There's conference rooms. So if they need to meet with clients, um, they don't have to go to Starbucks or they don't have to meet their clients inside of their house, right? There's a place that they can go to that's professional. Um, the other nice thing about a co-working space is it does create that density within your community where there's people from all sorts of different backgrounds. So um, we have a lot of different cases, even here in Grand Junction, we have people who have been coming through town. Uh, and like I have a, a kid, TJ, who is an amazing graphic designer and has been living out of his van for the last year and was traveling to all sorts of different locations. Boise, who's he was just driving around doing the remote thing. Um, and he stopped in our co-working space one day um, and I was able to connect him with three different people that needed graphic design work and he lives here now um, because he was able to connect with people that could you know, pay his bills and he liked the area and so he could make it, he could understand how he could make it work here in Grand Junction. Um, and that's the benefit of co-working. That's the benefit of having all sorts of different companies um, together. So um, the other, uh, so this is kind of a, a good visualization of what co-working looks like. And um, again, each co-working space is unique. And so there's no, there's no ideal thing, but there's uh, different things that most co-working spaces provide. So I'm gonna show you that on the next slide. So again, the, what we want to do with co-working is provide benefits um, to small and micro businesses and remote workers. So um, we can do that by attracting different demographics. And um, again, I always call this the shadow workforce. And so again, there's all these people in our town that are starting um, small businesses or working remotely. Maybe they work for Google or they work for um, Apple, but they work out of um, their home, right? And so as uh, community developers, we want to figure out who those people are and um, and by having a co-working space, uh, you give a place that can facilitate um, an efficient place for all of those people to work, which allows you to identify and inventory everyone who's coming through your town or working um, remotely in your town and figure out who they are. Um, also, I spoke about this just a second ago, but it helps kind of create that entrepreneurial density. So this is something that we're hearing a lot um, right now in our co-working spaces. We have a lot of people who are moving out of Denver. Um, they are wanting to get out of the big city 
um, and they're they're signing up and working in our co-working space. And one of the things that we hear a lot is, oh, this is really nice. You know, every time I'm in the co-working space, I still feel like I'm in Denver. So I get the advantage of living in a small town, but I have a cool place where I can come work. Uh, there's other entrepreneurs like me that I can relate to. You know, it's downtown, it's in a good location. And so um, having all those people in one building really creates critical mass and, and um, a lot of excitement and momentum. So that's really important. And then uh, the next point is, again, we're working to eliminate barriers to entry for small businesses. So if you're starting a small business, first of all, it's really hard. Um, there's a lot of things that you need to buy or invest in for your company. And um, so it can be extremely capital intensive. And so going from your, your home to actually having um, a business that's up and running is, uh, is really hard. It's hard to sign a 36 month lease if you want an office, if you don't know where your sales are coming from next month. Um, it's hard to invest in a bunch of furniture. Uh, it's hard to do all those things. And with, biz with a co-working space, we give all of those resources to businesses and there's no long-term contracts. So fast internet, uh, we have a gigabit internet here. And because of that, we have tons of businesses that work here just because um, internet is not um, readily available or it's cost prohibitive. So um, I know that this is a really big topic that a lot of communities are trying to figure out. And again, it's, you know, there's sometimes there's middle mile solutions or we have broadband that we've, um, been able to run into our community, but middle mile is not the problem, right? It's the, the last mile that gets really expensive. And so if, you know, a company has to spend 30 grand to get internet run to their building, and then it's still going to be $1,500 a month. If you're a small business, that's completely cost prohibitive. Um, I always joke with a co-working space, you can run gigabit internet into one spot in your town and then it becomes like the gas station for broadband. So anyone that needs to access that fast internet to be um, competitive or um, give them a competitive advantage, then can access that. And again, this helps allow us to have a better understanding of what types of companies are coming in. So um, our uh, co-working space, we have six video production companies uh, that all work in our co-working space because they needed the fast internet. And so, um, we're finding all sorts of companies that are coming and working out of our co-working space because they couldn't afford to pay for it themselves. But um, being able to sign up on a monthly low price um, is a perfect solution for them. Some of the other benefits, again, uh, all the furniture is included. Um, conference rooms, so professional conference rooms where they can do um, webcasts as long as they don't lock themselves in the lot of cube and it kills the internet. <laughs> um, and then the, uh, we do classes and events. So we host um, weekly and monthly classes for entrepreneurs. You know, we'll have people from uh, the Secretary of State come and give classes about like uh, trademarks and patents, or we'll have a bookkeeper come in and talk about how to set up your bookkeeping. Uh, we've got an event space here. So uh, we have all sorts of different um, events taking place in the co-working space all the time. Last night we had a State of the Union address by our school district um, and we had a uh, hundred people here. And again, this co-working space really just becomes a hub for activity, not only for entrepreneurs, but for anyone that um, needs to connect. It's a great place for that. So community is a big part. So co-working is a lot less about a building and a lot more about uh, the individuals within that building and connecting people. Um, we have so many stories. I have a, another girl <coughs> who moved here from Palisade or who moved here from Michigan and she's living in Palisade um, right now. And she's like, I, <laughs> she's like, everyone here is married and has kids and I'm the only single person I know. And uh, was just really struggling. You know, she wanted to live here. Uh, she had some family here. Um, but she didn't know how she was going to do it. And since she's moved in and started working at the co-working space, she has friends, you know, and um, is able to really kind of develop roots in the town. And it's given her a place of stability. Um, 
And then again, the, the last part about co-working that's really beneficial is just the flexibility. Um, like I said, if you're starting a business and you have to sign a 36 month lease for office space, that can be really scary. Um, we have a lot of businesses that are just starting out and they can, um, you know, they sign up for one month and see how it works. And if they need to take a month off, that's great. They'll show up the month after that. And so it allows them to connect to the resources that they need to, but they're not, they're not completely tied down um, by it. So this next picture, um, this is the software that we were building for proximity space. And I wanted to show you this. This is just the dashboard. Um, you can see like some of the money that's come in um, at the beginning of the month. And what's really important is we have a, a door access system to where any of our members can come in 24 seven. So it allows you to run your co-working space locally. Again, you can hook internet up to it in any of the businesses that need to utilize that. Sometimes we have, we have entrepreneurs who are single parents and so they need to work really early in the morning or they work really late at night after their kids go to bed. Um, it's totally flexible and they can utilize the resource here in town and um, access the resource whenever they need. Uh, the other awesome thing is, you know, co-working spaces are, they generate revenue so they're very sustainable. Um, we've seen all sorts of different models. We've seen uh, private models, public models, and a lot of private public partnerships, um, especially in small towns. Uh, we have a, a partnership with the library where the library provides our full-time employee to run and manage our space. And in return, we give five free days a month for all library patrons. And so um, we're seeing a lot of creative business models like that um, that keeps the overhead low. It keeps the co-working space running smoothly without um, without extreme overhead and um, is a totally sustainable model. Um, and we're seeing this pop up in big cities. We're seeing it pop up in really small towns too. So um, Natarita, we've got a co-working space in Ridgeway. Um, and so, yeah, and we'll just kind of wanted to show you some of that. Um, so we started connecting co-working spaces last year uh, with the proximity network and are the fastest growing uh, network of co-working spaces in the United States. Um, obviously, we've got a lot of activity taking place in Colorado uh, because that's where we started, but we're going to be seeing a lot more activity taking place in other states as well. Um, and there's huge benefits to uh, these co-working spaces um, connecting together. So as we talked about earlier, one of the, the one of the last point number six on the things that you need on the onion was density. And one of the big challenges that we faced in Grand Junction is that we had some of those components, but we didn't have all of them. So we have um, a lot of entrepreneurs, we've got pretty good workforce because of the college, but we don't have a good network of mentors and we don't have a lot of access to capital here in Grand Junction. But our friends in Telluride have uh, a large mentor network and they have um, a lot of capital up there. And so by combining all of these communities together and everyone working on one platform together, um, we can really create digital density, um, which gives us all of the resources that we need. So what we're working on is in addition to running these spaces, we're creating a platform that connects all of uh, these co-working spaces uh, together, like you see here. And what we can do with that is aggregate the database from all the co-working spaces. So if you are looking or you have a, a person that's living in your town that needs a developer, they can search the database and pull up all the developers in the database. Um, if they need a person that helps with programming or they need a welder or they need a, someone who can help with um, 3D printing, they can pull up those um, members and, and see everyone in the network who can help them with that. Um, we also have a company directory. So uh, like I said, we are finding out about new companies every single week that we never knew existed in our town. And the same thing is happening in, in towns all over Colorado and the nation, especially in these small and rural communities. We want to be able to identify them so that we can connect those businesses to the resources that they need. Um, we've also added um, <clears throat> an events manager. So 
any um, events that are taking place around entrepreneurship, we can post in a centralized place and then entrepreneurs can figure out where to get plugged in um, into the community and then um, job boards as well. So we have uh, people posting on job boards and then we're able to connect to all of the members that are working inside of the space spaces and then let them know, hey, if you are wanting to hear about a graphic design job, you know, we can kind of begin to connect the remote jobs to uh, remote employees, which creates sustainability in those locations. <clears throat> so again, um, I just have a, a few more slides here, but I, I wanted to reiterate the fact that the people who are working in our co-working spaces are um, young people who are doing STEM jobs, right? Uh, science, technology, um, engineering, and math. So these are high paying jobs, and these are people who are living in our communities. And I think a lot of times in economic development, we're trying to figure out where do we find more jobs, where do we find more jobs. A lot of these people are already living in our towns. We just need to be able to identify them and figure out what they need to continue working in our community. Um, if they're trying to build a company, let's find them and then figure out what they need in order to continue growing their company. So um, these are young people who are choosing to live in small towns and are choosing small towns because they love um, the benefits that you get from living in a small community. And what they're really looking for is uh, other young people that they can connect with. Um, these are kids and um, youth that are living in our community. And what we wanna do is figure out who they are and see what they need to stay. So not every young person wants to live in a small town, but for those that do, um, we wanna give them every resource that we can in order to keep them here uh, and retain them. So this is Ashton. He's an eighth grader and uh, he participated in our GoCode Colorado competition, which is a, a statewide app development competition. Um, he was actually too young to participate in the event, uh, but we waived the rules for him and let him go in and uh, no one had really ever met him. Um, and so when we did the event, everyone was asking like, how are things going? We weren't sure how he was gonna do. Um, they had to build an app and then they had to create their own business pitch and they would pitch it like Shark Tank. And so he was just hammering away, working all weekend. And um, when it came time to do the pitches, he destroyed everyone. <laughs> he was the best participant by far. And so um, we wanna find more Ashtons and we wanna, we wanna figure out if he wants to stay here in town, how can we connect him to uh, a cool company or um, do anything that he needs in order to keep him here. Um, I put these in here. So earlier this year, both Forbes and Inc. Magazine who have talked about proximity space. Forbes ranked proximity space the number one co-working space uh, on earth. And then Inc. wrote about proximity space and uh, named them the number three co-working space in the United States. And again, it's less about the three co-working spaces that uh, we're running and more about um, the network of co-working spaces all over the place in small and rural communities coming together and joining forces to create sustainability in these small areas is um, something that's very unique. Um, so that's that's really what I have so far for the for the presentation. So I really wanted to open it up and uh, see if there were any questions uh, that I could answer for everyone. I'm just going to throw out a question, which is, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of these, the like the high, higher tech jobs, um, maybe somewhat unfamiliar to some of us, um, you know, that may be more involved in, in different kinds of industries or, or fields. Can you talk about the opportunities to work remotely? Um, I remember talking to Josh and he talked about a kind of like the way the workforce is changing and the percentage of jobs that um, will be where it won't matter where you live. It'll be like location neutral type of jobs. Can you talk about that and like what kind of opportunity that might present for small communities? Totally, so um, thanks for asking that question. Um, remote jobs, like more and more jobs are gonna be remote. And actually by the year 2020, 50% of all jobs will um, maybe not be remote, but will be able to be remote. So anything that you can do from your house 
is considered to be a remote job. And so um, this is really important because that means that people can really live where they want. And for a long time, everyone was moving into metropolitan areas and leaving um, small communities because that's where all the work was. And in order to get work, you had to live in that community. Um, for the first time ever, again, 50% of all jobs will be um, remote. And so that means that people can live and move wherever they want. And so um, it's a really big deal. Being able to attract uh, people to our community has been easier and easier, but um, that, that's why it's important for us to inventory all the individuals, not just big companies. Um, the other great thing about remote jobs is that they are a lot of um, technical jobs. And so um, people are, are getting big city salaries, but able to live in smaller communities where cost of living is lower. That's awesome. And, and with the kind of skills that it takes to be able to access those jobs, are those skills that, that people can learn in small towns? Are they skills that they could even learn through their high school programs? Um, can you talk a little bit about that or, or then how a co-working space could help people connect to those jobs? Yeah. Um, so again, I think, I think what's so important here is having a good understanding of who is there and having a good understanding of what companies are needing and what companies are looking for so that as co-working spaces, we can begin to kind of facilitate the connecting of these dots, right? Um, we have a co-working space in the network that's actually out of um, Frisco called Evo3. And they have started a, a coding school. And so they're actually doing not only coding schools for adults, but also running uh, programming classes for elementary school kids uh, within their school district. And so they're saying, look, more and more and more people are going to be needing programmers in, um, in the future. And so we want to be kind of the boots on the ground that are coming up with all the solutions around that. And they offer classes. Um, and I think that uh, that's one great way to do it. Um, does that answer your question? Uh-huh. Um Vanessa is asking, what about coordinating with online tech and training courses? Yep. So, um, again, I think this is really what, what Evo3 is doing and what we're hearing a lot um, about that is taking place. So, uh, Galvanize is a coding school that has popped up and gained a lot of notoriety. Um, they're based out of Denver. Um, but cl classes like that are, are showing up all over. Um, we're actually working hopefully in the next year to be able to offer classes like that, that we can pop, um, that we can distribute to all the co-working spaces in the network. Because one of the challenges is, um, you know, just a, a lack of resources or not having teachers in your town. If you're a really small town, maybe people don't have those skill sets, but by um, focusing on an online solution, people could come in and take the class still, and you can get really high caliber teachers um, that just pipe into your co-working space or pipe, in, pipe into your area. Okay. So I think online solutions are, um, are awesome, especially for small towns that may not have those uh, instructors in their community. Awesome. And I, I saw Vanessa also piped in, perhaps hosting them in co-working centers where the online connection is faster. Yes. Um, and, and then Lynette Roland um, and her team piped in, um, how big of a space is needed to start a co-working space? Um, I don't really think there's, there's like the best size of space. I think, um, again, in Ridgeway, our space is, is really small. Um, in Grand Junction, our co-working space is, you know, it's technically like 5,000 square feet, but really uh, 2,500 of that is really what's open for co-working space. And so I think it's better to have um, a small space that feels full and has a lot of energy and excitement in it um, than, than waiting to try to get a huge space. Um, and so I know a lot of co-working spaces start really small and then they add a second location or they expand. And um, I think that that's a great way to do it. Yeah, one of the, one of the other things um, 
Vale actually has been doing this is uh, they, they haven't had a full-time co-working space there, um, but they've got an entrepreneur who owns like a little wine bar and she's actually turned her wine bar into a pop-up co-working space just to get uh, feedback from the community to see if this is something that people would be interested in. So once, uh, I think she was doing it once or twice a month where um, it'd be like the second and fourth Monday of the month, she would turn her little restaurant wine bar into a pop-up co-working space and have all sorts of people come and pay her to work there for the day. Um, and so it's not something that you have to um, necessarily allocate tons of capital that you don't have in order to get your co-working space started, um, but you can test it. Uh, we're also in Ridgeway, uh, the business model that we, that we started our co-working space with was we found a property owner that had um, a great piece of property that was vacant. And so we said, we'll partner with you. We'll fill it as a co-working space uh, what is your goal? What do you want to make out of this space? They gave us their number and we said, okay, if you'll work with us and let us pay you as we get more and more members, we'll pay you 10% more than what you're asking for. And so we built a partnership with the property owner um, and just worked on really building the community and filling the space for them, um, which allowed us to move in for, you know, relatively low amounts of, of money to get the space up and running. Very cool. We like to hear creative solutions like that. Um, other questions? Let's see. From Vanessa, pop-up space would be a good community partnership project. Absolutely. Um, another great community partnership project um, that we've dealt with is I talked about our partnership with the library. Um, we also have our, in Montrose, we have a partnership with the Chamber of Commerce. And so we split, um, we split the salary basically for the person to run um, our co-working space with the chamber up there. So it's great because then the chamber gets uh, valuable insight on the new companies that are, are coming into town. Um, and then we can keep that, the overhead low for the co-working space to keep it uh, profitable and sustainable. Very cool. Um, I'm going to ask a question that I have a little insider knowledge here. I, um, I'm, I, I understand that both in Grand Junction and in Montrose, you've piloted some apprenticeship or uh, intern, maybe it's internship is the correct word, mm -hmm. programs with local high school students and some of the um, small business entrepreneurs who are working out of the space. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think that this is a, 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 a big thing that people are trying to figure out is uh, I think there's a big movement on apprenticeships as uh, college tuition gets more and more expensive. Um, and so being able to identify high school students that we can connect to jobs and then let them work into the job is an awesome solution. Um, and so we have been working with kind of the school districts and trying to find um, help in identifying students that would be a good fit and then connecting them to um, companies that are looking for apprenticeships. So uh, I feel like I didn't answer a question. Will you ask it one more time? I want to make sure that I answered it. Properly. No, I, I, I think you did. I, maybe you were a little distracted by the chiming in the background. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but just, yeah, if you could talk, just asking to talk a little bit about how that, those apprenticeships are set up. And is, and is it the, those of you who are helping to run the, the space who are coordinating those? I'm sorry, I'm using the wrong word, internships. Mm -hmm. Are you helping to coordinate those internships or um, how does that work? Yeah, we're, we're playing a little bit of matchmaker. So identifying what the companies are needing. So uh, we've had interns uh, at Proximity. Uh, one of the other hats that I've, other businesses I've worked with is Hoptocopter and we've worked with an apprentice there. Um, and so each company needs different things. Um, and so if we as the, the co-working space owners um, or managers can have an understanding of what each company is looking for and what help they're needing, then we can kind of, you know, play matchmaker and connect the dots for students and, uh, and companies. Okay, cool. I'm going to read a question that came up. Vanessa, you keep sharing some great articles with us, so thank you. We'll send those out to everyone after. Um, BB asked me um, on the side here, if someone has a high-tech talent, 
um, such as a DBA, I don't even know what that is, or a developer, do they need to join a co-working space to be able to network or do you have a database of sorts where folks can find hard to find talent in small towns? Yes, so a um, couple different things. So we, we started a, a company called Launch West Co before we opened our co-working space. That is that database. So if they want to sign up for Launch West Co, which is just Western Colorado, so Launch Western Co, Colorado.com, um, they can sign up there for free and create a bio um, where they can add all their skill sets, which allows people to find them. Um, it will also allow them to search the database and find um, other people that they may be looking for or remote jobs that are being posted on there. Um, and so that's a way that we're <clears throat> trying to help create kind of that digital density that I was talking about, which is really connecting the resources from each community. So I would tell them to sign up there for free. And then again, co-working is really the physical manifestation of that in each town. So uh, if there's a co-working space in town, I would tell that person to go to the co-working space because then they're actually in a physical location where they're going to be connecting um, with other like-minded people or, you know, with um, kind of whoever's running the co-working space that can help them uh, find resources. Do you know if there's anything similar to that in other regions, other rural regions of the state? We have folks in the San Luis Valley and um, in southeast Colorado. Yeah, so what we're, what we're working on doing is merging Launch West Co into proximity. So every co-working space that's in the proximity network will have that same tool set where they can connect everyone and um, tag their skill sets and, and really bring them into a larger network of people. I think one of the other things, I guess, as I'm thinking about it, when we were looking at starting our co-working space was, um, you know, we looked, we, we worked on building our community first. Um, and that was the, the most important thing for us. And so, like I said, we did events for two years before we, um, we started our co-working space, but we looked at a lot of different locations and your co-working space business model was really predicated on um, the location and what the lease is and how much space you have, you know, so the, the business model is really built off of the location. Um, by building our community, then we could go to each location and try to figure out which was going to be the best spot. Mm -hmm. And once we identified a spot that we thought was going to be a good fit, we were able to go and pre-sell all of our office space and our co-working space. We were able to pre-sell a lot of the membership types. And so we were cash flow positive from day one because we had built our community first. And I think okay. that was something that was an important um, important insight that I could share with all of you is if you don't have a co-working space, but you're looking for something like that, start by doing events. And every time you do an event, have people sign up on an Eventbrite uh, link or, you know, get everyone's name and number and email address and put them onto a newsletter so that you can continue communicating with them. And then once you're ready for that co-working space, you know, we would do tours, two tours a week and say, we're going to do tours. We would cast the vision tell everyone what we were trying to build and we were able to get people to buy in and sign up and um, register for memberships before we had ever spent a single dollar. Um, so that really made, um, made it a lot easier for us to connect to that. I have a question for you. Will you walk me through, let's say I live in a small community. I think I, I think I want to make this happen. I've been working for a while on kind of building interest, building the community. Maybe I've identified some possible spaces. How would I go about partnering with um, the folks at Proximity Space? Or how could you partner with me and my community to help me um, get this off the ground, um, like mentorship? And then if we were to become, say, a Proximity Space in my community, then what would that exactly look like? How would we be partnering with you? And, and what would you guys get out of it? So um, that's a great question. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of things. So, we work with co-working spaces all over the nation. Um, we work with a lot of people who are wanting to open their co-working space, but haven't even opened it yet. And so we do, you know, calls like this every two weeks um, to learn and talk about best practices, what your business model should look like, how to attract people before you have 
opened your doors? How do you do events? Um, and so we do a lot of um, kind of consulting on the community building side of things and, and we'll work with people all the way through every step, um, even before they've opened their co-working space. Um, as far as how this, the software and everything works, we uh, can help with access. So you don't have to worry about your, your doors not being locked at night or everything. So it automates uh, membership access. It automates uh, the system for onboarding members, um, as well as billing. And then we have a lot of those tools like, like Launch West Coast for helping continue to build the community and do events and stuff like that. How it works is it's um, just a flat 5%. And so it allows co-working spaces that are just getting started. Um, if they don't have a bunch of revenue, it just takes 5% and that includes all of your credit card processing fees as well. And so it's, it's, it's very inexpensive and we'll just continue to grow as the, as the membership levels grow. Um, so, so it's 5% of your membership fees that you pay back to proximity space and that pays you guys for providing the software to run the whole co-working space platform and the door locking and that kind of thing. Yep. And that includes credit card processing fees as well. So okay. it's really cheap. It's cheap. Um, and and then, then what do you charge? What do you guys charge if anything for the upfront sort of consulting and walking people through the process of starting one? We don't charge anything for that. We don't charge anything for that. So that's, that's all included. And then it also gives us, um, the other thing that we're, we're doing is connecting all the spaces. So it creates like travel passes. So if your members are living wherever and need a place to work when they're in Denver one day or whatever, we have co-working spaces there that they can drop in and work for the day um, and vice versa when there's people, you know, maybe they're in Grand Junction for, for my example, because they want to go mountain biking on the weekends people can stop in and work at our co-working space. So it just is a, is a really nice uh, benefit. And as the network grows too, we want to, you know, we're gonna be working with big companies and say, okay, if you have remote jobs, post them on, on the job board so that we can push those remote jobs into remote locations. So we can help, um, help members living in some of these smaller towns find good work and stuff like that as well. Awesome. I see Jessica has a question. Yeah. Did you have themed events three times per month over the two years? Yes. So um, what we did is every, every month we had three events. And um, again, the first event that we would do is called Beer and Business. And that was really just the, the, the networking event for anyone interested in startups. And the kind of the format of the event was it would go from like 730 to 830. And then, um, you know, the first 20 minutes were hang out and grab drinks and say hi to everyone. And then we'd usually have an entrepreneur there speak about their business and what they would, what they were doing. Um, and then the rest of it was just have more drinks and hang out. And so it was really just a, a, a really simple networking event. Uh, then, like I said, we had our coffee and code event. And so we identified a local programmers who wanted to run that and we said okay you guys <laughs> do whatever you do right and so they were um, in charge of running that program and they would go over like different you know the benefit of different coding languages or you know talk about um, different topics and then our last one was the Colorado um, uh, creative professionals Western Colorado creative professionals and so Again, each, each month we would come with a different topic, but it was really about bringing people in different industries together and catering each event for the different demographics. Okay. Awesome. I see Rhonda um, sent in a question. What kind of bandwidth do you need for proximity space startup? There's no specific um, requirements there. Again, if you have, there's a, there's a big benefit for a co-working space to have great bandwidth, um, because it's it's a that's some that's a sticky point for your business. So when we were first uh, starting in Grand Junction, our building has literally been under construction for a year, <laughs> and um, we had members that were paying and working at our co-working space the first year, even though it was under construction the whole time, because the internet was so important to them. So. For the video production companies, for example, 
you know, in order to upload a video and send it to a client somewhere else, uh, with their internet would have taken like 15 hours. And like we have a lot of companies that they were uploading videos on their cell phone because it was better than the internet that they had at their office. Whereas, so that's a, a 15 hour commitment for them. Whereas they can come and upload the same video in our space in 20 minutes. So, so I got, I have, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm so sorry. So a lot of our communities don't have anywhere close to good internet. It's a, it's a challenge within the community as a whole. Um, can you talk about, have there been any proximity spaces you've partnered with um, or that you've helped to start where you, they've actually worked with the local government um, and agencies to try and improve the internet um, or any ways that communities have gotten around that hurdle? Yeah, I think, um, so I'm, I'm trying to think of specific examples, but I think what is really important is to begin conversations with um, local elected officials and um, some of your community leaders to identify a good location. So if you're, I know a lot of the spaces that uh, we opened, that was one thing that was really important to us. And so before we had selected a spot, we wanted to identify a spot that either already had maybe uh, broadband connected to the building or it was going to be easy to do so. And so, you know, some buildings, there was, there was no fiber anywhere close. And so it was like, well, we can get it to you, but it's going to cost, you know, 20 grand just to connect it. Uh, whereas other buildings are like, oh, it's right here, <laughs> you know? And so I would say um, prioritize that if you can. And I think a lot of communities are trying to figure out the broadband um, problem. And so if you can work with them and say, we're wanting to open up a co-working space, we're trying to find a good location. Or if we find a location, would you guys be willing to help us connect broadband and then we'll open it up to the community? You know, I think um, everyone's trying to figure it out. So. Uh, mm -hmm. The experience that we've had is everyone's been really open and willing to, um, and and that's that's how a lot of our stuff worked when we first started our co-working spaces too. Is like we were very transparent, and it was like this is what we're trying to do. These are the things that we're struggling with, and how can we figure it out? You know. Okay, great. I, I've heard that sometimes um, the uh, like local government buildings will often have um, faster internet before everybody else does. Yeah. So maybe that's a good reason to try and pursue some of those public private yeah. partnerships. Finding like, a, and a lot of those local government buildings are underutilized. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like, what if we, we could hook up the equipment and all convert your underutilized building into a co-working space. We're doing that in Fruta right now. So we're working with the incubator who is in, they have, they have space in one of the local government buildings in Fruta and like it's not being utilized well. So we're like, well, let's just turn this space into a co-working space. And then, you know, it, it's got fast internet and so people can access it. And every time someone accesses it, you're gonna have insight on who that person is, what their business is, what their skill set is, what they need in order to grow their business. And so um, you turn that into a place that facilitates entrepreneurs and you can gain more insight on kind of your community or you know, who's traveling to your town that would love to move there, but they don't know how, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you can connect them with the resources that they need to make that process easier, then that's a huge win. One question that might come up um, is, that I'll just throw out there is, if, again, the hypothetical, I'm somebody in my community want, really wanting to start a co-working space, I think it might be a good setup. How much capital do I need to have on hand to get a basic space um, ready to go? That's a good question. Um, it, it really varies. I think that, um, you know, we have some spaces in bigger cities that are spending tons of money. We in Grand Junction started with, you know, not very much money at all. Um, we weren't generating any money off of launch. We were actually, as a matter of fact, everyone was working like two and three jobs and we were starting this on the side because we didn't have money to do it. And so um, we are able to identify a location and work with the building owner um, that gave us tenant improvements. And then we went in and pre-sold a bunch of our offices and worked with people and they paid money up front. And so um, I think we spent about uh, $60,000 to get our space up and running, but I don't even think you need to do that. I think um, 
different spaces require different levels of um, capital improvement. And again, I think if you need to be super lean and mean, um, it, it's really more about creative thinking and trying to figure out how to um, get it up and running uh, as efficiently as possible. So I know that's not like a great answer, <laughs> but um, you know, if you can find a good spot that has the amenities that you need and you can put furniture in there and you have members that are, are willing to pay you to be a part of the co-working space, I mean, then you have a co-working space. And so, um, yeah. Is there an amount that, that's typical for a co-working membership? I, I imagine maybe Grand Junction might be different than say Natarita in terms of what the market is. Yep, and I would say, uh, again, like every good business, I mean, it's about asking questions and getting feedback. So for us, um, our 24-7 access membership gives members, uh, obviously, 24-7 access to the co-working space. Uh, all their conference room rentals are free and everything, and that starts at 149 bucks a month. Um, where, you know, then we have a dedicated desk that's 249 and then our small offices start at uh, 499 a month. Um, and so, whereas like in bigger cities, obviously the prices are a lot higher. Um, and so it, it really varies, but I think that's, that's about normal. We looked at a lot of different co-working spaces before we mm -hmm. opened it. So somewhere along the hundred dollar mark to get mm -hmm. in and, and running and be able to operate within the space. So a hundred bucks a month, mm -hmm. um, or a little more than that is a good place to start. Okay. And if anyone needs, has more questions, my, my email address is on there. It's just Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at proximity.space. We have, you know, I'm happy to like dive in more specific um, on cases or we have pro formas that you can build out your business model for your co-working space and see, okay, how many people do we need to get in the space to be, um, you know, profitable or whatever. So mm -hmm. we can work with you on, on all that as well. If anybody wanted to make a road trip and come to visit any of these spaces, would you guys be open to talking with us about that? Absolutely. Cool. Okay, great. Um, let's see, I don't see any more questions in our chat. Does anybody have anything else before we wrap up? I'm not cool. seeing Okay, so um, I just want to say a couple of words. One um, is that um, we will be having our next webinar on Tuesday the 16th at 2.30. Um, it's going to be the Colorado Blueprint, um, learning more about um, the state level program to provide technical assistance around economic development in small um, rural and distressed communities. I know Proximity Space has partnered with them, so yeah. we might hear a little bit more about you guys then. So. Um, any last thoughts? Or last. Go, Vanessa. Yes. Um, is there, would there be a way to get the word out to the um, different community partnerships? I, I try, I, I'm, I'm in Yuma, and I'm, I'm sort of on the resident team. I've, I've had some health problems, so I do it from, do, I'm doing this from home. Uh, but um, I checked, and they didn't have anything on their, fa on, the, on the Yuma Facebook page, and I got to wondering if, if maybe the local the local the local partnerships could use a little sort of extra notice not be able not count on having them be able to trip over it on facebook or twitter okay yeah so i would um i would definitely talk with the um the community um leader i think you've got a community um connector or a coordinator yes. in yuma i would suggest talking with them because it's been the local coordinators and connectors who have been getting the word out locally. So I think that would be great feedback mm -hmm. um, for you to give to your team. Um, and also I'll just- well, I, was, I was going to give them that anyway. <laughs> okay, great. And I'll just remind people that um, we will make a recording of this and all the other webinars in this series available on was the Colorado Trust website. And, um, and so you can watch these again with your team or you will 
um, have links available there if you want to share mm -hmm. them on your Facebook pages for your resident team or anything like that. And for those people who prefer to um, kind of watch it together in a group mm -hmm. and then talk That's about another it, one. Um, the links will be there. And I know a lot of community coordinators and connectors are planning to share those with their teams um, and have a conversation together. Um, and, and also for those who might have a hard time getting online. When this comes back up on when it's available on the website, and I'm going to post it over on my community Facebook page, um, I'm going to tag the Chamber of Commerce too. Very cool. Yeah, I, I know that in at least Montrose, the Chamber of Commerce is now located in the co-working space. Mm -hmm. So they've co-located okay. there. Very cool. And I see, um, I see something from Lynette. Thank you, Brian, your enthusiasm and interest um, to help us is much appreciated. And um, I also, I just want to note that Brian um, did this for free for us today and waived the, the small honorarium we offered him. So thank you for donating your time to develop this, Brian. And um, I see you also shared proximity online meetup link as well that's where we'll share best practices or you know we'll hear from co-working spaces all over the nation and you know a couple weeks ago we said what were the best marketing tools that you did over 2017 that actually converted people into members and um, it's just a, a great resource um, to to dive into kind of co-working and see what's working way cool that's fantastic. Thank you. One of the things that we talked about in Olathe, the demographics of Olathe is that at least half of the community speaks Spanish at home. And and we're interested in thinking about what would it look like to create a co-working space that was really accessible to different cultures mm -hmm. and comfortable. Um, and so one of the first steps we'll take is to translate mm -hmm. this and all of our other webinars into Spanish so that um, people from a variety of perspectives can um, be involved in this conversation and think about what could work and imagine what that could look like in their community. That's so cool. I would just add to that. So one of the things too that is so important before we opened our co-working space one of the things that we learned by doing so many events and building the community beforehand were what were the things that were missing. And so every community is different. Um, we, we didn't really have a space for remote workers or anything, but I know in a lot of the small towns, um, you know, you have maybe oil and, an oil and gas town that doesn't have a lot of oil and gas anymore. And so maybe a co-working space that was geared more towards engineers or mechanics or something like that would be great. And so it's really sharing the resources that are cost prohibitive for entrepreneurs that becomes really important. And so by building your community beforehand, you can, you can gain better insight on what is needed. Hey, if we were able to provide XYZ asset to the community, what would be the most valuable, right? And so we're seeing co-working spaces in all sorts of different, um, areas. So we have now a co-working space that's opening up in Grand Junction that we're working with um, around real estate. We also have another one that's all geared towards the construction industry. And so um, different industries are coming together and saying, well, let's share these, these resources and it helps entrepreneurs um, start businesses easier. So it doesn't just have to be high tech stuff. And I think that that's something that's really important is uh, every community can this is it really comes down to the shared economy and figuring out what does your community look like what type of entrepreneurs do you have in your community and what are the resources that are hard or cost prohibitive for them and if you can provide those resources you're going to have people showing up to your co-working space mm. and lynette um, wrote in and said how about an ag tech co-working space maybe yeah i think that that's awesome so being able to one of my favorite sayings is that tech is not an industry, but a tool that applies to all existing industries. So um, a lot of times we talk about tech, but tech is being applied to everything. And so ag is a, a, a huge industry. And um, again, get all your ag companies together and say, what are the things that's really hard um, that you're missing out on right now? Or if we provide that we could provide that would be beneficial to you and uh, figure out what those assets are and then um, bring them together in one space where people can, can utilize them. Yeah. Great, thank you for that. Okay, well wonderful. Any other last questions or thoughts that folks wanna share? Okay, I think, I think we're maybe closing up. Thank awesome. you, Brian, so much for your time. Thank you everybody who joined. Um, and um, 
like I said, we'll be sending out contact information. Brian, you offered your email, so if it's all right, I'm going to include that in there too, yes, so people could reach to you directly. Lynette says, yay, yay, yay. Um, so I can see there's some excitement out there around um, the possibilities that this might present for communities. So thanks for sharing what you do. Um, thanks, everybody, for taking the time to participate, and um, we will be in touch. Awesome. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, Ag Tech would be great in Yuma too, says Vanessa. Okay, um, and, and uh, feel free to, if anybody wants to be in touch with each other, feel free to reach to me and I can help you connect. connect. So, okay, great. Thank you all.